Hey, good morning, everybody. It's the April Slow Flowers member meetup. It's great to see some familiar faces and some people I haven't seen for a while. So it, uh, representing from all across the country. Um, it, since it's April, I did want to show you my first bulb harvest. I wish you could smell these amazing hyacinth. Um, they're just fabulous. They're so fat and big, they started falling out of the container. So I had to cut them. And the tulips, they're all from... Longfield Gardens, and um, I wish you could smell them, but I know you're all growing bulbs anyways. We're starting to focus on all of our spring activities. Um, one thing that we just announced uh, or kind of reminded people as the, as the American Flowers Week uh, Botanical Couture Invitational. So if you're at all interested in um, participating as a designer of a botanical couture, uh, now's the time to uh, submit your application. And you can find that at American Flowers Week. Uh, dot com. And um, we have someone on here, Stacy Lee, who's going to do a design, right? Hey, you're thinking about doing a design for 2023, right? Yes. Uh, it, the, the peonies aren't going to be in, in time in order to submit for this year. So we're playing the long game. Up yeah, in the that's okay. I love knowing something's in the bank for the next year, right? Yes. Uh, we we have are very excited. Good. Well, I was thinking about you when, uh, when I was n bugging people to sign up for this week, this year. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. We okay. have um, five or at least five botanical couture looks um, already in the works. And uh, our dear Nisha, who is our cover designer from last year, says she's going to do something. So Nisha, tell us a little teaser of what you might have in mind. I'm, I'm, let's see my, okay. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, I know I think I want to do something more futuristic. Um, you sent me I, a, a sketch that was really futuristic. Yeah. I don't what know. What was it I inspired wanted... by? I can't remember what inspired that. Oh, I can't remember the designer, but it was a collection that was done in the nineties, I believe. Oh, so yeah. Thierry um, Moogler or something. Oh Is yeah. That... Moogler. Yeah. 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 It was fabulous. Okay. Well, you're on the spot now. Uh, since Stacy's guaranteed for 2023, we need Nisha to do something for 2022. But anyway, please reach out if you um, have any questions about that. And it looks like we're getting our, our guests today. I'm, I met Chet and Christy Anderson in Longmont, Colorado, it, back in like 2010 or 2011. I was there to speak at the Denver Botanical Garden, I think it was 2011. And somehow I knew of them through the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. Lo and behold, we were working on this book, The 50 Mile Bouquet. The 50 Mile Bouquet came out 10 years ago this year in 2012. And uh, most of the people featured in it are on the West Coast because I was living in LA at the time and working in Seattle. But um, we got to Colorado, David Perry, the photographer was there and we invited ourselves to, uh, to photograph and interview uh, Chet and Christy. So here's the inside spread and Karen's gonna put it up on the screen. So I will we'll say that, but we're giving away two copies of the 50 Mob Bouquet today in celebration of the 10 year anniversary of that book's publication. It's still in print. And we're also to celebrate uh, our special guests, Chet and Christy Anderson. Okay, there's the inside spread. And uh, I'm going to read some of this to you about a year on a flower farm by the numbers. This was 10 years ago. And this gives you a sense of the scale of what uh, the, of the Fresh Herb Company is um, producing. Um, they have, this was 10 years ago. In a year, 12,000 mixed bouquets. 25,000 sunflower bunches, 10,000 lily bunches, 10,000 peony bunches, 5,000 hanging baskets, and 100,000 potted herbs. And you can do this in a state like Colorado when you have a, a, a really amazing greenhouse. So um, we, Christy and Chet are going to join us. There he is, the man. Hello, hey. Chet. Hi, Chet Anderson. Hi. How are you? Hi. Little, uh, little technical glitches here in the Rocky Mountain West. <laughs> it's okay. We have all been through it, and uh, we're so glad that you could join us. Oh my gosh, Chet, what a scene behind you! It's so good to see yeah, you. Yeah, lots of herbs on the floor, and we still have a few lilies left in the greenhouse at the far end. Wow, can tell us uh, how big the greenhouse is, and when did you um, 
when did you install it? Was is this your first one, or did you have like a, a more elderly well, we one before out this? With a small ground to ground house, about three thousand square foot house. This was like eighty three. I think in eighty five, maybe we built two bays here. And a few years later, we added two more bays. Another year or so later, we had a fifth bay. These are all gutter connected houses. Um, our total square footage in here is about 16,000 square feet. Each bay is about 29 by 108. So that's a, a kind of a modular system then. It, it, the investment of kind of phasing in the expansion is made it affordable for you or made it, I guess, manageable yeah, so for you. This kind of greenhouse, you just add to it by just adding another row of columns and another set of trusses and away you go. It's, it's, it's okay. pretty slick. And then push the wall. If I was out. a younger man, I'd probably add more, but I'm not. So, <laughs> for an operation of our size and scale, this size greenhouse works out quite well. Okay. Um, and also because of the climate in um, Colorado, you're able to start pretty much grow, have plants growing year round, right? Yeah. Well, we need a heat in the winter, obviously. So, each bay has a. a a gas fired unit heater. Um, and then we have a bank of fans and the far end we have a cooling system, an evaporative cooling system that keeps the greenhouse cool in the summertime. Mm, right, right. Because you have huge swings of snow on the ground and then almost 90 degree weather in the summer, uh, right? I say, if you don't like the weather in Colorado, just wait five minutes. So. <laughs> how it goes but generally it's great right because it's very sunny the sun's very intense so growing things like lilies for example that really like a pretty intense light uh it's great we do it all winter long without any supplemental lighting and we don't have any issues due to low light and uh, they actually like it because it's a little cooler in here sometimes it's gonna be a challenge because greenhouse is hard to keep at 70 degrees especially when it's 100 outside but we come close. So you start seeing the greenhouse here, all these flats of herbs on the floor are all culinary herbs. So up to about the middle of January, the whole greenhouse is full of lilies. And every time it also, we're about running out of herbs by the middle of June, third week of June. Because after that, you get more close to fourth of July, you can't give the plant away. It's, it's very, very curious. But as the herbs sell down, we start big time replanting lilies, usually six, seven, eight thousand at a time. And in no time, the house will be back full. Well, I think Chet, maybe he could restate it. That you have kind of two major growing uh, phases for the lilies early in the year and later in the year. Could you just maybe restate that? All right, so we grow as many lilies as we possibly can all year long, but we make room for the herbs for that short, uh, growing selling season of herbs is runs roughly January through June. And then we're going to slowly but surely the, the whole greenhouse is then replanted with lilies. So we have lilies growing all year, just not quite as many right now. Got it. Got it. The, the basket thing over top is a great way to use this, uh, sort of this extra space above everything else. Um, we used to grow a lot more baskets. We're sort of phasing out of baskets because they're they're a little stressful and or we're moving on to other things, but we do grow a beautiful basket. I must tell you. Yes, you do. I remember walking under those and feeling like I was in the hanging garden of Babylon or something. It was just so lush. <laughs> All right. So let's go look at the lilies here. Okay. So you're growing in crates. That's sort of the. Correct. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at that. So. Okay. Um, all the lilies from Holland, where we get ours, come in these crates. As you can see, they're. They're black and maroon and green and black and different colors. They come two to 400 in a crate, depending on the size of ball we're using. So this is what they call crate culture. Each crate, we plant 20 bulbs, uh, whether that's Asiatic or Oriental lilies. Uh, some people will do fewer because of light situation, but we have such good light here. I can afford to kind of cram these things up with, with about 15 or 16 bulbs. Wow. The great thing about growing in crates is once you're done with the crop, 
you can just dry the crates out, lift them up, take them outside, sweep up the floor, and I can use the screen house for, for the herbs, for example. Then we just bring the crates back in, try to reuse uh, as much of the old soil as possible, and then we lay them all out on their lines and, and uh, replant and go. Uh, that is sort of mind boggling to just do the math on that. The me you said soil, is it a particular type of medium that you're using for, for it's lilies? A good well-drained uh, potting soil. We use pro mix here. So you can't see because the guys are down below the lilies right now, but we're replanting uh, uh, this week's lilies. So what we'll do is we'll cut off all the old stubble from the past crop. The guys will go through and yank out all the old bulbs and with the old bulbs comes a little bit of soil you replant the new bulbs and replenish the, the crate with new dirt so we're always getting new dirt uh, reintroduced to the crate which is good so let me explain a little bit about planting lilies so we plant the lilies at the bottom of the crate the crate's about eight inches tall uh, the lilies get arranged in lines at the bottom of the crate, and then dirt covers all the way up to the top of the crate. Um, and then we put the drip tape on there. The most important thing about lilies is the growth of stem roots. So you need to have that bulb at least six inches deep. And then it gets nominal growth at the bottom of the bulb. You know, like, like a tulip grows a lot out of the bottom of the bulb. Lilies, all their business is in that business between the top of the bulb and the and the and the where the lily comes out of the ground. So that's about that six inches of stem in the soil throws out all these roots, and that makes for a really good, healthy uh, lily. Uh, water is by drip. Let's take a look at that. They look so healthy, Chet. Jeez. Oh, they're happy. <laughs> they're happy, as Christy says. You can sort of see the different stages of growth. We plant every week to 10 days. Typically plant three to 6,000 bulbs per week, depending on you know, kind of what space we have available. But you can see here how we do the drip. So the, the crates are arranged kind of horizontally this way. Mm. And across a horizontal side, three runs of drip tape run over each crate, the wow. length of the run. Right. Uh, the drip tape, the emitter spacing is four inches. So it's pretty tight. So you want that whole box to get kind of evenly wet. So all that goes back to uh, a valve, uh, the head, head of the house. And ties into an irrigation pot. Are you putting fertilizer in that drip um, irrigation or do they we just have inject, all the- We inject the fertilizer like um, uh, triple 14 usually, uh, probably once every week to 10 days. Uh, it's largely to keep the foliage nice and green. Because the great thing about lilies is the bulb itself is the food, right? Right. That's what I was wondering. It's a little sketchy. It's in the winter when they finish a little slower because of the because the length of the day, uh, and then you can sort of see that bulb start running out of food a little bit before the, the, the bloom finishes. But uh, just a, a little bit of extra fertilizer once a week or so keeps the foliage nice and green and it has a crop finish. So the two kinds of lilies we grow: Asiatics and Orientals. Orientals are the big, big flowered ones with a wonderful sort of vanilla, uh, that maybe scent. And then uh, Asiatics are, are smaller blue and they don't have a scent. Some people like the smell, some people don't. Uh, but it's <laughs> nice to have both, both kind of lilies around. I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around the volume. So when you, are you mainly selling straight bunches of lilies and if so, how, how many stems per bunch and how do you package them and, and all and of that? So lilies are bunched, uh, our lilies are bunched, uh, Asiatics are bunched fives, Orientals are bunched threes. 
Uh, we pick three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, to three in the morning. You get them all picked in the carts over to the barn where they're sort of graded, uh, bunched, banded, sleeved in, into a bucket of water into the cooler. And then uh, for us, they go out then once or twice a week uh, from our coolers to our stores and our uh, customers. Um, Chet, before I have other questions about distribution and marketing, but um, uh, one of our um, attendees wants to know, Terry wants to know, do you replant new lily bulbs every season or are they overwintered? And um, uh, One cut and they're done. Now, now they will come up again, but they might not bloom until maybe the second year. So they're great if you want to use the old bulbs in your garden around the house or something. But commercially, it's one and done. Yeah. But we pull all ours out and dump them in the field for a compost. Uh, in the winter, the deer come along and snap them up. And they eat them up like crazy because there's some sort of protein source or something in them and they're sweet. But, you know, three or four giant piles of lily, old lily bulbs just get consumed pretty quick out there. So can you, um, can you, when you say go out to your stores, can you tell everybody about your distribution and, and why you are, have these massive amounts of lilies going out into the marketplace through the, throughout the Rocky Mountain region? Oh, we do a lot of work with uh, Whole Foods and their distribution center for the 40 stores in this Rocky Mountain region is in Denver. And they buy mostly all of our lilies. Uh, we have some go to some florists, some to uh, a subscription program we have and a few other places, but I'd say Whole Foods buys the bulk of them. And you've had that, you've had that relationship since I've known you. I mean, this has been over a decade, right? Yeah, for probably 20 plus years, as long as they've been in Colorado. And, and before that, we used to ship salad greens to them when, in Austin before uh, they were in Colorado. So in my other life, I was a vegetable grower for 20 years. And then we quit growing vegetables. We grew salad greens for many, many years, sold that business, and then got into all ornamental things. So baskets, lilies, we have three acres of peonies outside, we have another two or three acres of, uh, of other kinds of perennials, we grow a bunch of different sort of fillers and annuals. And until recently, we had a, another field a couple miles down the road of another 15 acres that we grew all sunflowers on. You took me up there. Were you leasing that field? Yeah, we'd leased, leased that field for almost 30 years from... Uh, from the gentleman that uh, was there. Uh, he passed away, uh, the farm sold. Uh, there are hemp growers there now. Ah, no surprise, right? But, you know, after that many years growing down there, it's kind of nice to just sort of be back to uh, something a little more manageable. Mm -hmm. They were growing uh, probably 20 plus acres of flowers every year, in addition to all the greenhouse work. And you now it's just a ton of work. Yeah, as, yeah. As you can imagine. Um, so we're, we're a little smaller now. We're down to the home place, uh, growing about six or seven acres, and then everything that comes out of the greenhouse. Well, let's talk about what's happening with herbs because, um, you know, that kind of takes you back to your roots of being, a, you know, a, a salad green and food grower. So, yeah. You know, originally, Fresh Herb Company, we started growing uh, fresh cut herbs for bunch sales to restaurants, bulk sales to re uh, groceries and restaurants. Quickly realized that uh, you can only grow so much in Colorado before everything sort of went dormant in the, in the fall and winter. And we hit on the idea of plants to grocery stores and uh, garden centers. So... From the start, we had this herb program where we grew plants in the three and a half inch pot and distributed. And we have very strong programs in, in the grocery stores, two or three chains of groceries. And, uh, uh, and about four garden centers. Um, let's go look at the table here where they all start. It might be helpful. Yeah, I'm showing people your website while while you're talking, and there's a lot of buttons that say "Buy some plants today." So that's is that for the home consumer? Oh, they can purchase us subscriptions yeah. so, and. You, know, you want to have an herb garden at home? 
or you put it in pots or something around your house, you just go to the grocery store and get your herb plant. So we grow a variety of perennial herbs, like oregano, rosemary, thyme, mint, uh, some biennials, like parsley, and yeah. a ton of basil, because everybody likes basil. Oh my gosh, you have tons of options under this variety. You So what you see here is uh, the bench we do all our propagating on. It's about 90 feet long, uh, eight feet wide. Uh, it has these tubes all over the top of it that uh, circulate warm water. And we do all our seeding or stuck things to root like mint and rosemary on this bench. And the, the you know, warm bench things germinate quickly and uh, things that stuck root quickly. So from here, it sits on the bench for probably three weeks, and then it gets moved up to a four inch, a three and a half inch square pot that goes 18 in a tray. So these are the, the these, how many uh, plant starts are in each of these flats then? I, I mean, you must've said it, but I might've missed it. How many plant starts in each flat? Oh, eight, 18, 18 in the flat. Okay. And so, do you? In the course of a year, we might we'll probably grow eight, nine thousand flats. Yeah, it's so interesting, Chet, that you um you ha I went a couple of years ago pre COVID, you were doing these culinary bowls that were kind of decorative and sort of a value add for the flower departments at Whole Foods, and you've pivoted away from or moved away from that to just do four inch pots of individual herbs, right? Right. So we still do some mixed containers. We used to do a lot of farmers market work, and that's where a lot of other kind of thing came in. But you know, we're, in the last few years, we've been trying to simplify operations around here, so a lot of the stuff has sort of gone by the wayside. We don't do farmers markets anymore. Um, we try to stick to bigger programs that we can sell to bigger garden centers and the groceries. Oh, you're selling to garden centers too, then that makes sense. Oh yeah, yeah. There's there's, there's still some garden centers out there. It's a real good one still. Well, and also every, you know, this return to the home garden uh, during the past two years, pandemic gardening was a big deal. So you probably just kept. Oh, it, it was insane. So the first year of COVID, nobody could catch the wave because everything was planted. You know, it all sort of happened, you know, March, April. And by then, most growers are, it's over. You know, everything's planted and ready to go. It's hard to increase. Last year was the first year you could really take advantage of it. And things just exploded. Uh, they say 20 million new gardeners were added to the ranks. So that's pretty huge. Yeah. And, and there were some questions of, well, are they going to keep doing it? Well, it turns out they really enjoyed it, which is great. So the whole bedding plant, um, gardening industries had this whole, whole rebirth, uh, kind of thanks to COVID. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's rewarding. And I think that the floral industry is benefiting from it, but I think, the nursery industry is definitely benefiting from it. Yep, yep. Well, I think, you know, people are home more. They like to have flowers in their house. You know, we've, we've seen that. And, uh, people, I think, are becoming more aware of cut flowers. You know, it's been a long road for us to hoe. It's no different, but uh, I oh, think man. generally people uh, appreciate flowers more than they did some, some years ago. I mean, Chad and Christy, you were, you guys were doing slow flowers before I even knew about the cut flower industry. You're like, three plus decades into this and you're the pioneers that so many people have wanted to emulate and build their business businesses around this sort of approach that you take. And it's, it's inspiring. Okay. It's, uh, you know, just trying to figure out what kind of market you have um, and just grow great stuff for, for your folks. Um, it's been a, it's been a challenging 40 years at this. But you know, you learn something new every day, you make mistakes every day. So, so it kind of keeps it interesting. <laughs> well, let's, when I was looking at your website, I, I was reminded I want to talk about what you're doing with on-farm events. So can I pop that up on the screen and have you talk a little bit about um, how you're using your farm as, as a local destination for people? Sure. Okay, so then let's see, uh, on the website, there's, if you scroll down, there's, well, first of all, people have to see, this is an overview of, did you get a beautiful drone shot of your farm chat? Jeez. So beautiful. 
That's that's the next generation. Chet and Katie do all of the website, social media stuff because obviously we we're not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> that's Christy's voice. Okay, so here we have host your event and stay while you play. So this is here's some photos of weddings, dinners, um, you know, other kind of corporate events at the Fresh Herb Company. So this has also become a really, you know, favorite of locals and. Both Nisha and I have been to the Field to Vase dinners at uh, the Fresh Herb Company, and, and uh, we had a wonderful time more than once. And so I just wanted to have you talk about what you're doing with your farm venue. Um, yeah, so, um, okay. yeah, we did uh, two uh, Field to Vase events here, uh, which were a lot of fun, uh, you know, 100, 120 people. Uh, before that, we'd done fundraisers for the local symphony here, school things, uh, this and that. And uh, more and more people were approaching, hey, can we rent the farm for this event or that event or a wedding or this or that? We decided, well, this, this could be an interesting uh, alternative income stream with, with, without the backbreaking work. So we started to put together the Boulder Flower Farm as an event sort of center. Uh, we do 12 events a year, uh, that's all. Um, three quarters of them are weddings, uh, others are birthday parties or corporate events or, or just parties for folks. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a little bit of work too, um, but um, it's kind of raises awareness about what we're doing here on the farm, which is great. Sort of like the work we do with the uh, uh, America's grown uh, because yeah. um, people are always interested where their stuff comes from and they get to see where their flowers come from. Well, um, you, you are famous for leading the farm tours chat. I, I have some fun photos of you like a Pied Piper with every event seems to start with a tour, right? They're just blabbing on incessantly. You know? <laughs> but uh, the event business has been good. It's been, this is our third year, I think. And uh it's good. It's just, you need to manage it. You don't want it to be doing tons of events because you can burn out on it pretty easy. But the most folks we uh, meet through this are really, really interesting folks. And uh, they really love the farm. That's why they're here. Yeah. Why do you do 12? Is that part of your uh, zoning limit or just your personal me <laughs> managing? Uh, uh, the, stress? Uh, the rules and regs here in this county are pretty, pretty tight. And, uh, just we're not interested in doing tons of this sort of work um, it, for a little yeah, bit of it's yeah. fun. Yeah. Keep it exclusive. Uh, I saw on the website you do, you're offering the greenhouse for indoor events, like a corporate gathering in the winter. How do you clear out the greenhouse for something uh, like I, that? I think that's a, a marker that got a little carried away. Um, <laughs> oh, you're, like, you're... we're backpacking here all winter. Uh, <laughs> we've had a few inquiries about, but, doing something in the greenhouse so there might be a time when there's two or three rows of lilies that could be moved because they're due to be replanted and if the timing was right you could have a an event in the greenhouse in the winter It'd be kind of cool like a small, smaller group yeah but um, generally generally this place just fills up with plants you know crazy. the way to make the greenhouse uh succeed for you is to keep it full of product all the time so something's right. always going out the door, helping pay for the greenhouse. Our right. heat bill, as you can imagine, in Colorado is, is pretty good in the wintertime. Um, yeah. Conversely, our electric bill is pretty high in the summer to keep the place cool. Uh, but we always have great stuff coming out here, whether it's succulents or lilies or herbs or baskets. We have uh, down here, I'll show you something kind of fun. Yeah, it's like you've crossed over between nursery and cut flowers, and that gives you ability to diversify. I go back and forth. Um, we were really big into succulents for three or four or five years, so gobs. We had two, two bays here full of succulents. We leased two other greenhouses. It was full of succulents. Did all our own propagating. They're still incredibly popular, um, but again, trying to simplify, we decided to get out of the succulent business. But I have these baby jades here. They're absolutely specimen figures here. 
I've been kind of nursing for like, oh, the last five or six years. So I really can't sort of just dump these on the wholesale market because I have so much time in them. So we have probably have 200 of them here. They're all, you know, three feet tall, just big around. They're just spectacular. Yeah, they belong in a conservatory or something. They do. They do. So we're going to do farmer's market three times this spring. Mother's Day and either side of Mother's Day uh, here in Boulder. And try to try to move these out. And because if you if you water them anymore, and if you haul them out of the greenhouse, you don't want to haul them back, right? No, no. Once out, don't come back. So, folks who are uh, either from Colorado or have family or friends in Colorado, send them to the Boulder County Farmers Market before, during, and after Mother's Day, and have them look for Chet and Christy. Because yeah, this is come, like come get a, a specimen, Jade. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Hey, um, somebody is asking uh, the name of the manufacturer of your greenhouse. We can put that in the chat. Uh, Nexus. Okay. N-E-X-U-S. They've been recently bought by an outfit and they're now called Prospiant. Okay. Prospiant. Prospiant. Just, just Google it, Nexus. Their old name comes up. Okay. So their Ranger manufacturing uh, facilities were outside of Denver here. And it's a great, strong, beefy greenhouse. Uh, and they have greenhouses all over the world at this point. But we selected them years ago just because of the kind of durability and the strength of the house. And so we get some pretty heavy snows here occasionally. There's some pretty fierce winds uh, in the winter time. And we've generally gotten along for 30 years without a, without a hit on these greenhouses. Um, Karen found the link and put it into the chat so people can find it. Um, Chad, I think it's interesting that the, the origins of that manufacturer are in Colorado. And I was wanting, wanting to ask you if you could muse a little bit about back in the day when Colorado was the carnation capital of the country. I know that maybe you remember that you and Christy from when you were little yeah, kids. We were, we were a little younger back in the 1800s. Uh. Oh, <laughs> The, uh, I thought it was like the 50s. Colorado was the rose and carnation capitals of the world, supposedly. And largely because, again, this, this intense daylight, sunlight, which roses and carnations really love. Um, and there were greenhouses all over. They weren't fancy like this greenhouse, which is not that fancy, or like today's greenhouses, which are really high tech. But they're mostly you know, frame things, you know, with that old corrugated nasty fiberglass nailed to the, to the stud walls. But a lot of people were growing a lot of carnations and roses back then. Wow. Been along in the early 70s, mid 70s. Uh, uh, for some unknown reason, we decided to uh, 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 help out Central and South America with, with their flower growing through different drops of tariffs, uh, aid, blah, 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 and effectively destroyed the domestic uh, cut flower industry in this country, which at the time was mostly things like roses, carnations, glads, you know, chrysanthemums, those are the big things. Then sometime around 70s, you know, this idea of specialty cut flowers developed. The ASCFG group, which many of you are probably Members of uh, uh, Deborah's work 70s. with Slow Flowers, Aaron's work with Florette in Washington. Now there's so many people that understand that there's so much more to flowers than roses and carnations and gladiolus and the ways to market them they're in, are infinite. Um, just been a really great change since that time, the dark time, the 70s where our industry just kind of collapsed. Yeah, I'm sorry, Go. I didn't mean to cut you off. You're proving that it's a great place to grow stuff. You're harnessing all that light and uh, clearly your plants love it and the people love it. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's great. Yeah, you know, we get two or three cloudy days in a row here and we get all cranky. <laughs> so don't come, you, don't, you go up in Seattle, I don't know how you get along. I know, don't come up and hang out in my yard. Uh, but uh, Chet, I thought it was the greenhouse uh, grow, growing um, flower industry collapsed because of the energy crisis in the 70s. And maybe but, that's wrong. Uh, well, that helped. Mm. But, you know, our, our, our 
supporting our competitors out of country is what killed me. The trade, the trade issues. Yep. Um, Terry is asking uh, something about, um, well, two people are asking about water. One is asking, isn't Colorado famous for geothermal water that, that could be tapped into heating, um, you know, greenhouses? Uh, and then the other person is just asking about just in general, how do you manage water usage to, like during a drought time? Uh, if I had geothermal, it'd be great because I'd have all sort of bench heating and stuff like this bench with hot water heat. Uh, some greenhouses locate next to big power plants, so they use the cogeneration off the plant to run hot water, steam to the greenhouses, and that's pretty slick. Uh, here, me tell you about the water. Yeah. Water uses in the greenhouse. I would say... Or, or on the farm in general, I guess. Okay, farm in general, we have uh, two sources of water. One is our pond which is filled by, um, through a ditch. Here in the West, you know, we get own shares of water to, to use the water. Um, so all of our shares of water are delivered to our ditch and then we pump out of the ditch and that water is our fields. Our fields are mostly drip irrigated because they're mostly perennials, though we have some overhead irrigation as well. Greenhouse used to use a well that was built next to the pond. And that went on great for many years until we had a kind of a disastrous flood about 10 years ago. I remember that. And it all but destroyed that well. The alkalinity in it got up so high, it was killing plants in here. It took, it took me a few months to figure this out. And we tried to flush the thing and clean it, do this, do that, nothing worked. So we ended up putting a domestic uh, water tap uh, into the greenhouse. So now we have city water, pressurized, you drink out of a hose, you don't have to filter it, doesn't muck up the equipment, so it's pretty slick. I should have done that a long time ago. <laughs> and, um, and, and we pay wow. a commercial rate on the water, so um, it, it doesn't really kill you, but you got to be careful on usage. Usage mm -hmm. in the greenhouse. Uh, I'd say probably close to two thirds of the usage of water is for cooling in the summertime. The other one third goes all the plants. Wow. So to keep the greenhouse cool it takes an incredible amount of water. Yeah. It's like you're, inter you're, you're either, like you said earlier, you're either heating it and paying, paying to heat it in the winter and paying to cool it in the summer. So there's no right. off season. Right. Right. The heating thing is uh, the biggest bite, but um, yeah, again, it's manageable. Here, you know, when the sun's out, even on the coldest day, uh, it, the fans have to come on and cool the house. So it's really overnight that the heating makes a difference. Even on a zero degree day, if the sun's out, you know, there'll be times the heaters don't run because it's it just the way the greenhouse works. Yeah, it's, it's keeping everything above freezing. Yep. Wow. So um, you're, I know you're, we're wrapping up. Uh, does anybody have any more questions for Chet and Christy? Pop them into the chat. I want to get Christy on the camera so people can say hi to her if she's up for it. I know she's managing the camera, so it yeah, might be I'll hard. <laughs> hi, Christy. Don't watch and see. <laughs> Tell us just quickly, not to get too personal, but you you live and work with this guy. How do you, how have you managed a family owned business uh, and raised your kids and laugh a lot and have fun? And um, it is, you didn't, you weren't born wanting to be a farmer, I'm sure. No, it's what I call the world's greatest bait and switch. I mean, we met in grad school, got married, and I came home from work one day and the thesis was being packed into boxes. And he said, if I really believe in ag preservation, I have to be a farmer. And they said, oh, well, how do we do that? You know, so, and so then, you know, off we go on this adventure. But it's really, it's a partnership and a division of duties. There are things that I don't do, like I don't have a clue how to grow a plant. And there are things that he doesn't do, like manage the bank account. <laughs> 
<laughs> good division of labor. Yeah. Wow. But you, you two are both very active in agricultural preservation issues in the state of Colorado. We were just telling me you were at a conference about that. Yeah, there's something that's been going on in Boulder for years now. It's called the Conference on World Affairs. And the idea is to bring in experts and, and people involved in any number of different um, kinds of things, political, international, art. And this one, this year was a new track on regenerative farming. And so um, I did two days of attending that conference and, and hearing people talk about how we're going to make our way out of the mess we've created. And it's, it's inspiring. It's also very depressing. So in any event, regenerative agriculture, look it up. <laughs> yeah. That's exciting. Oh, wow. Well, Christy, thanks for um, hopping on the camera and saying hi and being our technical uh, manager. I, I think that, um, you know, I just is making me want to come back and visit. I haven't been to uh, Colorado for so long. Well, come this way. We're yeah. like found plants. We're stuck here. So <laughs> nowhere to find us. <laughs> I, I love it. I'm going to make sure that I share um, the uh, chapter of um, our, our 50 mile bouquet story about the fresh herb company in our um, next newsletter. So people can find it and like two lucky people will receive a copy. Um, it's really amazing to think back about when I met you both and visited your farm in 2010 or 11. And that really sparked my whole interest in what has become the slow flowers, con you know, concept and movement and community. And it was really because of meeting farmers like you two, uh, who really, I don't know, just inspired me to, that there's a, a better way. There's a better way to have floral agriculture and sustain family farms and create, you know, something important okay. in each community. And thank you for so much of the messaging and, and tying us all in together, because I think what we see our future looks brightest when we think local, when we support Absolutely. local, we grow local, we eat local. That's our best, best hope for the future. So thank you so much for generating that momentum. Thank you, Christy and Chad. And um, I, next time I'm going to send you some kind of selfie stick so I can get you two on camera at the same time. But uh, this has been really fabulous. Uh, Chad, can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks for a great tour. And um, our, our attendees have all loved it. Be sure to tell folks that uh, if you have any questions, just send me an email and I'll try to help them out. Oh, Chet, that's great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, before... Yeah, before right we go, um, Nisha's going to do a drawing for uh, the two books to give away. And our next um, member meetup will take place on uh, May 13th, same time, uh, second Friday of the month. And um, we're probably going to have the designers of, who are part of the Slow Flowers Summit on and do a demo. So that will be that will be happening soon. Karen wanted me to remember, remind you that um, like last year, we took the summer off. So July and August, we'll take a break. If any of you have suggestions for fall um, topics, please reach out. Oh, thank you so much, Chad um, and Christy. And um, honestly, what a great day. I, I sort of selfishly wanted to do this so I could I could see you too and get, get caught up with you. So um, thank great you. to see you. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. And um, have a great weekend and good luck getting through Mother's Day and moving all those baby jades. I'm jealous. Yeah. Yeah. Watch you know. I'll do how it goes. <laughs> okay. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Um, great. So uh, thank you all for joining us. This was a lot of fun. And um, we had, I mean, what a tour. Love seeing you all. And um, hopefully we will meet in May. Take good care. <laughs>